Hello, everyone. My name is Rustem Sayakov. I'm the president of Multicase Incorporated. And today I'm going to present to you our new QSR system to predict acute inhalation toxicity. Uh, to give you a brief summary, well, actually, I have to read it. And sorry for a lot of text. Uh, why it is important? Uh, well, acute inhalation toxicity is adverse effect, uh, which is caused by substance uh, after single and untrapped exposure. And um, it usually happens over the period of 24 hours or less. And it can be caused by environmental pollution, or works uh, place and household exposure, and all kinds of chemical agents which can be inhaled. And regulatory bodies in European Union do require inhalation toxicity to be evaluated and it has to be performed on a high volume production chemicals and animals should not be used. Um, second point is, uh, is recommended to you perform the assessment we used the existing data doing all kinds of read across and QSRs. The problem is that um, some data are not in a vast majority and those QSRs are limited. So there is a problem. And that's why in this study we developed a set of QSR models using available to us data, um, which are mostly in public domain, and we used the acute inhalation toxicity data in RAP. This set consists of four categorical models, and they were designed to predict one of the four GHS categories for inhalation toxicity. And also the fifth model would predict the exact values of LC50s for inhalation. The models uh, demonstrate a decent uh, performance. We use leave group out uh, cross-validation approach and sensitivity in the range of 52 to 71 percent, the specificity 70 up to 74 percent, positive predictivity up to 73 and negative predictivity up to 68 percent. And we perform the external validation of this set and it assigned correct GHS categories to 75 percent of external compounds, which in my opinion, there's decent performance. And we maintain the very good coverage, which usually also a problem in this kind of models. And I will, uh, I will discuss identified alerts from different categorical models. And I can conclude that this approach provides a reliable QSR method for predicting acute inhalation toxicity of chemical substances or using only their structures. And now said that, I will explain why I just said that. From the point of view of regulatory, acute inhalation toxicity data used for satisfy, to satisfy hazard classifications and labeling requirements. And there are two guidelines which are involved, uh, TG403, or which uh, will estimate LC, LC50 values, or TG4336, which will estimate the ranges of LC, LC50 values pretty much uh, GHS categories. And both of them are generally meet the acute inhalation toxicity regulatory requirements for classification labels, so both of the approaches can be used. And it's also accepted by regulators that QSR models for inhalation toxicity may be used as early screening tools during the drug development or to support regulatory safety decisions. And those predictions can contribute to weight of evidence approach. So the most important point here, two guidelines, one of them concerning exact values and another one concerning the ranges of the values. And our objective of this project was to build models which would satisfy both of these guidelines. So one of them would do GHS categorical predictions, range estimates of LC50s, and another one will do the point estimate of LC50 predictions or more or less exact value. So how did we do it? So far, we used two major sources. I'm not saying that that's the only sources which exist, but this project is a, a one year old and it's definitely going to be updated. So I would say that this, is a, this project is a proof of concept, that it's possible, it's workable, it's doable. Uh, the major sources which we use so far is Artex database to which we have a subscription and the paper by Rayevsky et al, which was published in uh, 2011. Uh, all of these um, data are from public domain. Not a single proprietary chemical is included. We used the current then version of um, case alter software to build statistical models. 
we also used binary scoring system for categorical predictions and uh, we used as a main endpoint the acute rat inhalation toxicity for four hours exposure the training set which were assembled contained uh, close to 2700 findings 30 percent of them were clearly category one 21 category 2 30 category 3 and 10 category 4 if we're referring to ghs categories so more or less even distribution between at least three types of activities and a fairly minimal amount of these active compounds we had to pre-process the data aside for structure uh, verifications and cleaning we had to do to apply the binary scoring system we originally we dealt with concentrations as it was reported by various sources so uh, when we score it for binary system we have to apply the ghs criteria to assign either zero uh, which refers to negative or one which refers to positive label to particular chemical or particular model and for example for understanding the chemical uh, which would be uh, positive for from point of view of ghs category uh, number one which is extremely important would be assigned uh, category one and if the same chem if some other chemicals uh, do not feed category one they're still inhalation toxicant but not as potent as it requires to be category one they would assign uh, label zero for that particular model only i will explain later how it works in a little bit more details uh, again that's a recap of statistics of the learning set which we had to deal with and uh, as you can see for example if we deal with a category one model 30 percent of the chemicals were positive had label one respectively 70 percent of chemicals would have label zero so we have three to seven ratio positive to negative which is not very desirable ratio to build statistical model ideally we need to have one to one ratio and that's why we had to use down sampling procedure where a ratio of positive and negative would be equal a resulting the learning resulting learning set would um, vary in their size between 500 roughly 500 chemicals to 1600 chemicals and uh, remaining uh, chem compounds that's important we did not throw them away so when we did category one uh, model and we used 30% of 2,700 chemicals as positives, then we matched with another 30%, which were negative. Question is what happened with another 40% of chemicals? They were not thrown away. They were assembled into a data supporting database, which was used during the prediction, just to cover the entire structural space, chemical space, which was reflected by this uh, learning set. So we had a special algorithm to do that and that was implemented and in this way we were able to decrease out of the main calls which usually happens when you down sample when you down sample you literally throw away some of the chemicals and when you throw them away there is always a risk no matter how you choose how carefully you choose a chemical which you leave in your model there is always a risk that some of the thrown away chemicals will contain unique functionalities which will be not covered by your model anymore and that will produce unnecessary out of the main situations so we found a way to deal with that so that's um, workflow for our down sampling we had the original set 2744 compounds those were the base for a continuous model for that lc50 model so none of those chemicals for this model were thrown away but when it came to building down sample models we applied few filters the main the most important filter was similarity filter we tried to sort out all highly unique chemicals which do not have any similarity to the, even to the closest neighbor which, which similarity to the closest neighbor would be less than 0 0.3 uh, these chemicals again would not be thrown out they would be put in the supporting database so their functionalities are still preserved they just do not affect uh, the building of the models usually these kind of chemicals are very hard to uh, be incorporated into QSR models because they literally do not have any analogs there is no way to build any statistical relationship with fragments which this chemical contain they would produce alerts which are literally based on one compound which is very doubtful alert uh, we had overall 
838 compounds which would correspond to category one. And from this point of view, we had to find another 30, close to the same number of compounds. In this case, we found 836 compounds, which were labeled as zero or negative. Fine, that will give us our first model, which is roughly 1600 compounds. What is the next? We already know that 800 compounds are category one. We don't need them anymore to build less potent uh, inhalation toxicants models. So we would take them away. And from the remaining uh, pool, we would identify close to 600 category two compounds. And then we again have to pick up appropriate number of negatives and do the same thing for category three. We throw away 597 compounds identified in the second step. We end up with 800 compounds roughly as category three. And then we finally were end up with 260 compounds as category four. By this moment, by the last step, we did not have much of compounds left. We pretty much had close to 500 compounds overall left after all this category one positive, two positive and three positive were excluded. So that's how this down sampling was done. That means that these four categorical models have different size. The biggest one is category one, the smallest one is category four, but they do have one-to-one -one ratio of positive and negatives. Uh, the effect of this is presented in this table. And uh, just to identify this category one, two, three, and four, I use only one of the suggested by GS, uh, GHS criteria. I just use only PP, PPMs. I did not want to overcrowd this slide. And as, as you can see, the size of the models is decreasing to the category four. And the biggest model is the one which pretty much using all data and uh, able to predict exact value of LC15. So talking about the prediction, uh, since we used up all the chemicals which we have so far, uh, not much of um, ability for external validation, we still managed to set away some of the chemicals from categorical models and um, and we call those models balanced models because they do have equal, almost equal ratio of positive and negative. The numbers here are produced by leaf group out approach and we did 10% out 10 times. And you see that sensitivity, the sensitivity varies between 50 and 70%. Specificity is almost stable within 70%, 71, 72. Uh, positive accuracy varies between 60 and 74 and uh, negative accuracy more or less stable within 66%. Coverage is also stable, 60 something. That's the internal cross-validation. When we used external validation, meaning we set out, a, set out certain amount of chemicals, I believe it was 100 compounds, which would belong to four different categories, and we tried to predict their, these categories. We had pretty decent performance, which ranging between 75 and in some cases for category three, 100%, we were 100% accurate, accurate with external validation when we predict category three. For continuous models, for the model which predict RAT LC50, we did not have a, any external chemicals left, so this external validation was not available. And every time when we see uh, the out of domain situation produced by any of those models, it was verified with um, supporting database and if this functionality which was causing, supposedly causing out of domain uh, was found in the supporting database, the out of domain call was uh, dismissed. And in a, there is a peculiarity about um, case ultra models. Unlike some other uh, in silico systems, it will still perform the search for alerts. And if you see the out of domain coming from the case ultra system, that means that there are no known alerts, that this chemical would be negative unless it was one or two or three structural fragments of which we do not have any knowledge. And that's why this chemical was called uh, out of domain. So if we are able to resolve this out of domain situation, meaning to prove that those fragments are known and they are not affiliated with positive compounds, it automatically changes this call to negative. So. I know that some other systems start with checking for domain and then uh, immediately stop if they will find that chemicals out of domain. So for them, 
Auto domain effectively means no call. For us, auto domain means negative, but there is some clarification needs to be done. Well, how it is that we maintain the structure of coverage on a decent level? Again, we reduce the size of the models drastically sometimes, even like we five the resulting models is five times smaller than the original one. But due to our procedure of multiple uh, validations, we literally picked up the best candidates of hundreds of models created for each of those categories. We managed to maintain the ratio of structural um, fragments within each model more or less the same as the original model. It is represented by the structural diagram which presents counts of every functional groups presented in the original model which pretty much can be represented by the LC50 and one of the reduced models in which is in this case is category one. You don't have to look into those numbers, you just looked at the color of the picture which is uh, related to the numbers. The darker color is, the more number is. And if you just have a brief look into those um, variations of the colors, you see that they are almost identical. Actually, they, to my eyes, they are exactly identical. We might have a smaller representation of bands and rings, for example, in a CAT1, but relatively to other functionalities, it's exactly the same. So when we downsampled this way, we did not lose any of our structural coverage. Uh, alerts. Every statistical system is built on the alerts, and these alerts are very important. And we identified, but there is a clear distinction between alerts identified in different GHS categories, which should be obvious. When the model is built for acute toxicants, only uh, structural functionalities which represent acute toxic mechanisms would be picked up. Something less acute would be not picked up. And um, we also compared it with uh, alerts which were identified for overall models. For LC50, for example, you can see that there are uh, organophosphorus compounds involved, substituted anilines and phenols, which are known inhalation toxicants. When we look into GHS models and when we look into these first two alerts, which are presented the most uh, toxic um, by the most toxic category, category one, you can see teophosphoryl group and you can see esters of phosphoric acids. When we go one step down to less toxic compounds, category two, these functionalities are not present. I showed their top two alerts, but top two alerts are chlorocarbonyls and again some esters of phosphoryl groups. So, which is also understandable. Category three does not contain anything so drastically toxic, but still contains some toxic functionalities. And category four contains practically nothing. You can see that one of these alerts resembles third butyl group, which probably affects some um, toxicological mechanisms by simply providing sterical hindrance for some of the processes. And we also see the aromatic carbonyl groups picked up in pretty decent uh, numbers. 13 positive versus six negatives. So when you look into this alert, you clearly can see which which alert is coming from what, uh, from more toxic system or from less toxic system. There is no chance that the very last alert in this table, the one which is terbutyl group, will be found in a category one model. It's simply not possible. And as a conclusion, it seems to us that combining similarity-based downsampled models and supporting database for additional chemicals provides more sensitive prediction for inhalation toxicity and we do not lose any structural coverage. Sensitivity and the negative predictivity of new systems demonstrate reliable QSR method for predicting acute inhalation toxicity for chemicals and substances and we use only their structures. We don't need anything else. We don't need names. We don't need um, registry numbers. These are nice to have, but if you have only chemical structure, that's all what is needed. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, please forward them to these two emails and we would be happy to answer them. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you for attending and thank you for listening.